students, last time we talked about naming ionic compounds and writing their formulas. And in this lesson, we're going to talk about covalent compounds, writing their formulas and naming them. But first, what I want to do is take a look at this slide and just review something with you guys that we talked about last time. Now, if you take a look at these two compounds, iron two chloride and iron three chloride, you can see that absolutely they are different compounds. You can see that with your eyes. Now, if we were to try to figure out what the formulas are for these two, what we would first notice is that the top picture, iron two chloride, there is a Roman numeral two inside of the parentheses, and that does not mean that we have two irons. That means that our irons are charged how? Plus two, that's right. So we write that here, and then chlorides, chlorides will always do minus one. And how we know that is because we have this handy dandy little chart available to us whenever we do this chapter. So back here we can see we've got ions that are plus two and chlorides that are minus one. Now remember, we need to have a net charge of zero because a neutral compound is a happy compound. So in order to have a net charge of zero, we're gonna need one iron and two chlorides. And if you guys wanna do the little switcheroo thing here, you can do that. Don't take the charges with you though. And that would give us one iron and two chlorides. Now remember the subscript one next to the iron is still there. We just don't see it when there's a one because if we don't see a number, we assume it's a one. Now with iron three chloride, the iron has a charge of plus three. And chlorides always have a charge of what? Minus one, because that's what they have a charge of always. And if you don't believe me and you didn't listen in the past minute, go back to this chart right here and look there. Now, in order to balance out the plus three charge on the iron, we're gonna need how many chlorides? We're gonna need three, that's right. Because if you have plus three, you're gonna need minus one, minus one, and minus one to make up minus three. If you wanna do the little switcheroo thing here, you'd put the three down here, and you'd put the one down there. So what we have is we have FeCl3, and that is iron three chloride. Now, if we want to write iron two chloride and iron three chloride, in the old version, what we'll do is we'll remember that an us ending that's going to be the lower number charge. And the ick ending that's going to be the higher charge or the higher number. So that means that iron two chloride is also called ferrous chloride. And iron three chloride is also called ferric chloride. And you will still see the old Latin names quite a bit. So that's how we figure out which is which for these two very similar compounds. All right, moving on to covalent compounds. So what we just did, what we spent a lot of time on was ionic compounds. And those are compounds that are made up of ions, charged atoms, and they're attracted to each other by opposite charges. Now co covalent compounds are a different beast. So covalent compounds are composed of atoms that are gonna be bonded to each other 
not by an attraction of opposite charge, but by sharing electrons. So both atoms come in and they put electrons in the middle and they share those electrons. And that's what keeps them together, the sharing. Our electrons are not transferred like they are in the ionic compounds. So if you remember when we talked about sodium chloride way back here, we said that sodium had an extra electron that it wanted to get rid of and the chlorine wanted to gain an electron. So we had a transfer of electrons and then they became oppositely charged and that's what attracted them together and what makes them stay together and what is the ionic bond, that bond of attraction. So back to covalent compounds, we don't have that electron transfer. So we don't have positive or negative charges on our atoms. We have sharing of electrons. Now with our ionic compounds, what we saw were metals and non-metals getting together or a polyatomic ion, usually ammonium, NH4+, and a non-metal like chlorine that turned into chloride or a metal in a polyatomic ion or two polyatomic ions. With covalent compounds, what we'll see is a non-metal and a non-metal. So if you look at these covalent compounds right here, you can see that you have two or more non-metals getting together and bonding, and they're bonding through sharing electrons, not by transferring them. Covalent compounds are also called molecules. So when we talk about molecules, we're talking about covalent compounds. When we're talking about ionic compounds, we're talking about ionic compounds. Now, if we're talking about compounds, we could be talking about covalent compounds or ionic compounds or both. So at the bottom here is a list of some different covalent compounds. And you can see that we've got hydrogen and oxygen in water and carbon and oxygen and carbon dioxide and a couple of chlorines in our chlorine molecule. And we talked about this in lecture in chapter two about how some elements are naturally occurring in the diatomic state. And hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and chlorine are diatomic molecules. And then we have CH4 at the bottom right here. This is methane. So methane has a carbon in the middle and it has four hydrogens around the outside. So just to point out, we've got non-metals and non-metals. Now hydrogen, it appears up here in the alkali metal column there. But remember, it also appears over here next to helium because sometimes it has the properties of the alkali metals and sometimes it has the properties of the halogens over there. So that should explain why we're classifying hydrogen as a non-metal. Also, you can just think, yeah, hydrogen's a gas, so it's a non-metal. All right, so sharing of electrons. Why do they share electrons? Well, remember, everybody wants to have a duet or an octet. So either our atoms will go around trying to lose or gain an electron, or they'll try to share electrons in order to have a duet or an octet. So say you have a hydrogen, and the hydrogen walks into a hydrogen bar, and he sees a beautiful hydrogen across the room, and he walks up to her and he says, hey baby, how you doing? Can I have your electron? And the hydrogen right here says, no way. How about you give me your electron? And since they're both looking to have a duet, what they decide to do is what? 
is share. So what they do is they both put their electrons in the middle right there, and then they can both pretend that they've got a duet, and it makes both of them happy. So this hydrogen right here, it pretends that it has a duet, and this hydrogen right here pretends it has a duet, and those two electrons in the middle right there are called a covalent bond. It's a bond due to sharing of electrons. Now, those two electrons that are being shared right there, we can write them in a different way. We can write them as a single line right there that shows a single bond, but we have to remember that that line is two shared electrons. Now, we can start to understand why atoms bond the way they do and why we have H2O and not H6O when we think about the duet and octet rule. If we look down here at the Lewis structure for oxygen, we see that oxygen has six valence electrons. And remember that oxygen is in group 6a or 16 so that should tell you it has six valence electrons if you want to count over you'd have one two three four five six two s2 and two p4 that makes up a total of six valence electrons and we would ignore the two core electrons that come from the 1s that has two electrons in it. Okay, so back to this slide. So oxygen has six valence electrons, and it wants how many? Eight, that's right. So it's going to go around looking for somebody to give it two more electrons or somebody to share two electrons with it. And if you have a couple of hydrogens present, the hydrogens are also looking to share an electron with somebody so they can have a duet. So the oxygen says to this hydrogen over here, hey, you wanna share your electron with me? I'll share an electron with you. And hydrogen's like, sure. And that gives us this situation right here where the hydrogen is happy because it now can pretend that it has a duet. And then the oxygen is then looking for that eighth electron. And it sees this hydrogen over here and it says, hey, you wanna share an electron with me? I'll share an electron with you. And that hydrogen also says yes. And they both put their electrons between them. And that hydrogen can pretend that it has a duet. Now the oxygen, is also happy because it can pretend that it has eight electrons to itself and it has an octet. So everybody is happy in this situation. Now, if we look over here, we can see that some of the electrons are drawn with lines and some of them remain as dots. Now we only draw the electrons as lines if they are bonding electrons. So this pair right here and this pair right there, those are those two single bonds, one on the left side between the hydrogen and the oxygen and the other on the right side between the oxygen and the hydrogen. The electrons, the valence electrons around the oxygen that are not bonding, those are called non-bonding electrons. Those are right here and right here. And what we call our non-bonding electrons usually are lone pairs, okay? So oxygen has two lone pairs. The other way you could say it is oxygen has four lone pair electrons. But we usually just say oxygen has two lone pairs. All right, 
Now that we've got the bonding and lone pairs clear, let's go to naming covalent compounds because you guys need this for your nomenclature assignments and your formula writing. So how we name covalent compounds? Well, we're going to name the first nonmetal by its elemental name, just like we did with our ionic compounds, just the regular old name. So if we have this covalent compound right here, this molecule, what we would do is start the name out with carbon because that's its elemental name. Now number two says add a prefix to indicate how many of those atoms you have. Now the prefixes are going to be Greek. So number one is mono. So if we only have one of that atom, it would be mono. Two is di. Three is tri. And what is four? So a lot of my students say quad, but in chemistry, it's tetra. So quad does mean four, but we use tetra, which also means four. Five is penta, like the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. has five sides. Six is hexa. And seven is a weird one. Everybody wants to say septa, but it's hepta. Yep, told ya, it's weird. Now eight, everybody knows. Eight is what? Octa, you're right. And nine is nana or nona, either way you wanna say it. And 10 is the Greek word for 10. And in everyday life, we can spell deca with a C or a K, but in chemistry, we spell it with a C because that's what we do. Okay, so going back up to carbon in the name up here. We only have one carbon in our carbon dioxide, so we can put mono on the front and have monocarbon to say that there's just one carbon there. But the weird thing about chemistry is when it's the first element in the name of a compound and there's only one, oftentimes we just leave mono off. I know, interesting, but usually that's how we do it. So we're back to just carbon instead of monocarbon. Monocarbon is not wrong. It's just usually left off. Okay, so name the second nonmetal and change its ending to I. Okay, so O is oxygen, and we're going to change that to oxide. So... Right now, the name would be carbon oxide, but that's not correct because number four says we need to add a prefix to our second nonmetal, and we need to indicate how many are there. So I'm going to bring carbon down here just so I can have some more room. So I have carbon, and I've got two oxygens, so I need to put dioxide. Now, if it's any other, if it's anything other than one of them, you absolutely have to put the prefix. You could also call this a monocarbon dioxide. That would not be wrong. But like I said, again, a lot of times when mono is on the first element, we don't see it. Alrighty, moving on to the next slide. So let's name a few of these. So the first one you probably recognize. That one has a single carbon and a single oxygen. So this one is carbon and we only have one of them, so we could put monocarbon, but we just had that discussion, so we don't. 
but what we see here is the mono definitely shows up in the second element's name. So we have monocarbon, monoxide, but that's not what we call that. We call it carbon monoxide. And we ignore the first mono on carbon because of what we talked about. And then usually when there's a mono, it appears on the second element's name. I know, that's weird, and I'm sorry about that, but that's how it works. Also, what you might notice is that it doesn't say monoxide, it says monoxide. So where did that second O go? It just flew away. Well, what IUPAC says is that the double O is weird and hard to say, so when there's two of them there together, one of them just disappears. So we call that carbon monoxide. Now, if you wrote on a paper carbon monoxide, I would not mark it wrong. I would just make a note to you about that. Okay, so we've got carbon monoxide there. Now, number two, N is what? Nitrogen, you're right. So again, we could write mononitrogen, but we don't need to. So we have nitrogen, and then there's three iodines, and this is a compound, so iodine needs to change to iodide, and we've got three of them. And this is tri-iodide. There's three iodides there. Now, why the second I in triiodide doesn't just disappear like the second O does in monoxide? Uh, sorry about that again. That's just one of the things that, one of those weird anomalies. So it's not triiodide, it is triiodide. Okay. So, nitrogen triiodide. Now, number three, we've got two nitrogens and we've got one oxygen. So, for this one, we're going to put dinitrogen. And we've only got one oxygen. And this is the second element named, so it's gonna go from oxygen to oxide, and also the mono is gonna stay. But that's one of those weird anomalies where it's not monoxide, it's monoxide. Why? That's just how we do it, I'm sorry. So we have dinitrogen monoxide. This is also called nitrous oxide. This is laughing gas, and it's used in uh, launching rockets and motor racing, and it's good because it's stable and non-toxic, and it allows an engine to burn more fuel because it provides more oxygen than air alone. So uh, that's where you might have heard of this stuff before. Okay, number four, we've got SF6. So we've got sulfur or monosulfur. And if you're British, you'd spell that with a PH. And we've got six fluorines. So our fluorine turns into fluoride. And we've got to throw a prefix onto that. And the six is hexa. So what we have is sulfur hexafluoride. So again, fluorine goes to fluoride. And we have to tell our reader how many fluorides are there because this is a covalent compound. So remember with ionic compounds, remember back to our ionic compounds, you didn't say how many were there. If we had magnesium chloride, which is MgCl2, we did not say magnesium dichloride. And that's because those are the naming rules for ionic compounds. 
these are the naming rules for covalent compounds. So again, the ionic compounds, what you look for first to tell if it's an ionic compound is usually a metal or the positive polyatomic ion ammonium, which is NH4. And you can see in all of these compounds here, we don't see a metal. We've got all non-metals and we don't have the polyatomic ion NH4+. Now number five, we've got B2O3. So we've got two borons and how we write that is diboron. And we've got three oxygens. So that's going to be trioxide. We've got diboron trioxide there. All right, let's write the formula for our covalent compounds. Now writing the formula for covalent compounds is pretty easy because we've got Greek, Greek prefixes to tell us how many of each element we have. With our ionic compounds, we didn't have that. We had to just figure it out. But look at this, phosphorus pentachloride. Now, if we don't see a prefix on phosphorus, we assume that it's what? Mono, that's right, which means there's one of them. So what we have here is P for phosphorus, and then we have pentachloride. So we've got Cl and penta is which number? Five, that's right. So we have PCl5. Now, number seven is nitrogen monoxide. So how do we write that? No, just like that. All right, so eight is dinitrogen tetroxide, and that is N2O4. Now, I've also seen it written as tetraoxide. If you wrote it like that, that would be okay too, but I see tetroxide and tetroxide tetraoxide both okay so it's the whole two vowels next to each other is that a mouthful according to IUPAC and that's the official chemistry board that makes all of the rules and decisions for us so number nine says tetraphosphorus decoxide so that would be P for phosphorus and then tetra is four and then oxide, that's telling us we've got an oxygen. And the deck or the deca would tell us that we've got 10 oxygens there. So that's a whole lot of oxygens. So that's how we write the formulas for covalent compounds. Now, you guys have learned the rules for naming both ionic compounds and covalent compounds and for writing their formulas. And there's two different rule sets. And it's not too bad naming them when you're just working with one set. But the problem is that you're going to see all kinds of compounds mixed together. And you have to know whether you're using the ionic compound naming rules or the covalent compound naming rules. And how we're gonna figure this out is we're gonna look at the formula for our compound and we're gonna look first for a metal or for ammonium. So, do you have a metal or do you have ammonium? And remember, ammonium is NH4 plus. That's our most common uh, polyatomic ion that's a cation that we'll see and if you have either of these you're gonna be ionic and you're gonna be using the ionic naming rules now number one KCl if we forget whether K is a metal or not we just look at our periodic table and we can see that potassium is in the alkali metal column there. So we know that it's a metal. Now we don't normally think of potassium as a metal because we tend to think that potassium is in our bananas and how can metal be in our bananas? But that's a whole different ball of wax. So let's just look at our periodic table and identify the fact that potassium is a metal. 
So if we go back to this slide right here, number one, we've got a metal and a non-metal. And so that means that this compound right here is ionic, and we're gonna use our ionic naming rules for this. So our, our ionic naming rules tell us that we do not use Greek prefixes, the mono, di, and tri. So we do not indicate how many of each ion are present. We let the reader figure that out. So number one is potassium chloride. Moving on to number two. Number two is Na2S. Now usually when we're talking about sodium, which is Na, we're talking about sodium chloride, and that is our salt that we put all over our food. But sodium in chemistry, it's a metal. It's located in the alkali metal column right there. So we have a metal sodium and a non-metal sulfur. So number two is also ionic. So again, with the ionic nomenclature, we do not indicate how many of each ion are present. There's no Greek prefixes. So this one is just sodium sulfide. So sulfur goes from sulfur to sulfide. Now sulfide is completely different from our polyatomic ions sulfate and sulfite. So don't confuse sulfide with your polyatomics. So sulfite and sulfate are right there. Sulfide is a monatomic ion, meaning one atom, and it has a charge of minus two. Now remember that you don't write the charges in your formulas, and you can see one through 10 are written with no charges shown. Okay, number three, is that ionic or is it covalent? Well, there's no metal there. You have hydrogen and oxygen. Those are both non-metals. So when you have a couple of non-metals, that's covalent. So when we have a covalent compound, also called a molecule, we use a covalent compound naming rules, which means we have to indicate how many of each atom are there using Greek prefixes. So this compound right here that we all know as water is called dihydrogen monoxide. Number four, SO2. So we've already determined that sulfur is a non-metal and oxygen is also a non-metal. And if you don't believe me, we come on over here and you guys can see that sulfur and oxygen are over here on the non-metal side of the periodic table. So we need to use the covalent compound naming rules. So this one is also covalent. So, so we have sulfur dioxide here. Okay, K3PO4. Now in number one, we decided that potassium is a muddle. So we've got a metal there and then we have a whole lot of atoms. So potassium, phosphorus, tetroxide. No, I'm mixing stuff up here. And if it looks like it's like, huh, what's going on there? Again, remember that in your brain it should go ding, 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 ding. I probably have a polyatomic ion here. And indeed you guys do. You have PO4 and that has a charge of minus three that you don't see in the formula because we don't write our charges in the formula. So this one, because it's ionic, we don't write tripotassium. We just write potassium. And then we write phosphate. 
and to review our polyatomic ions, we can see that phosphate is right here. And just to remind you guys, with the polyatomic ions, you do not change the endings. If you change the ending of phosphate to phosphide, what you would mean is the monatomic ion phosphide with the minus three, the P and the minus three there. Alrighty, back to our problems. So FeCl3, it should be really obvious to you guys that iron is a metal because iron is a metal. But iron is one of those special metals. It's a transition metal with a variable charge. So the question is, is this iron two or is it iron three? And of course we're gonna have chloride here. So is this iron two or iron three? So do we want a Roman numeral two or a Roman numeral three? Well, if we look at our chlorides, we know that each chloride has a charge of minus one because chlorides always have a charge of minus one. And if you have three of them, then that's minus one, minus one, and minus one, which makes minus three. So in order to balance out that charge, you're gonna have to have the plus three version of iron. And how we indicate that is we put a three in Roman numerals and parentheses here. So that is iron three chloride. And I forgot to write, this is ionic because it has a metal and a non-metal. Now number seven, looking at number seven, we have all non-metals there, but number seven looks kind of big and clunky and odd. And what you might also notice is you've got this beast right here, which is ammonium. So that is our polyatomic cation. And that means that we are ionic. So, because it's ionic, we're not going to indicate that we have two ammoniums. We're just going to write ammonium. And then we have this big thing hanging on the end here. And it's like, what on earth is that? And that's another polyatomic ion. It's an anion, and that one is sulfate. Sulfate is right here. So we have SO4 and that one is a minus two. So we have ammonium and I ran out of some room so I'll just put it down here. Ammonium sulfate on that one. And again, you don't put diammonium sulfate because this is ionic. Now, number eight. SCL2. Sulfur is a nonmetal and chlorine is also a nonmetal. And when we have two nonmetals together, what we usually have is a covalent compound. Unless we see ammonium and we don't see ammonium there. So this one is covalent. So we need to use the covalent naming rules. So that means we're going to indicate how many of each atom we have. Except if you have one and it's the first element, like with sulfur here. So we have sulfur dichloride. And the di comes from the two right there and because this compound is covalent. Now number nine has copper on the front and copper should go ding, 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 ding. I am a metal. But copper is also a metal with 
a variable charge, so it's a little special, so we have to do a little bit of extra work. But first of all, we have a metal and we have a polyatomic ion right here. So this one is ionic. We have to use the ionic naming rules. So we're going to identify our first element, and that is copper. And because it's a transition metal with a variable charge, we have to say which one it is. Is it copper one or is it copper two? Because copper likes to do plus one and plus two. And then OH right there. That looks weird. And if it looks weird, it's probably a what? A polyatomic ion. So we go back to the polyatomic ion slide and we go, oh, there's OH right there. Although I'm not seeing it. So if we were in class, you guys could point it out for me. Oh, oh, I see it. It's right here. Okay. So hydroxide OH minus is right there on that chart. And coming back to the slide, we can write hydroxide on the end here. And remember, this is ionic, so I do not say dihydroxide because there's two of them. I just say hydroxide. Now, trying to figure out whether copper is copper one or copper two. Well, you have two hydroxides, so if we draw this down here in blob form, you've got that package that's minus one and that package that's minus one right there. And in order to cancel out the minus one and the minus one of those two hydroxides, you're gonna need copper to be plus what? Plus two, that's right. Because that makes a neutral net charge and a neutral compound is a happy compound. Okay, so this one is copper two hydroxide. That brings us to the last problem on this slide, number 10. So I'm gonna erase everything on this slide so we can have lots of room. Okay, so number 10 has P and O. So phosphorus is right here and oxygen is right there and you guys can see that they're both nonmetals. So if you've got a non-metal and a non-metal, then you're probably gonna have a covalent compound. And that means we're gonna use the covalent compound naming rules, which means we gotta use those Greek prefixes to indicate how many of each atom we have. So we've got two Ps, so that's gonna give us diphosphorus, And we have five oxygens. So remember that the oxygens go to oxide. And if we have five of them, that would be penta. And then when there's two vowels in a row, one tends to take off, except for when it's two eyes when you're doing triiodide, which is strange. So I have seen the diphosphorus pentaoxide before, but we'll write diphosphorus pentoxide because I see that more often. Okay, so that's how we name those ones. Now let's go ahead and write a few formulas and we'll be done with this lesson. And in the next video, I'll get on to naming acids. All right, so let's go ahead and write the formulas for these compounds. Now, number one says sodium iodide. Now, sodium is a metal. And when it's in the compound sodium iodide, we know that we have Na plus one, and for the iodide, we have minus one. And how did we know that? Because we identified that it's an ionic compound, and because we use this handy dandy little chart here, it says that sodium likes to do plus one, and our, what are we doing, iodine? 
Yeah, we were doing iodide, right? Yeah, iodide. Okay, and so our iodide likes to do minus one. And if we already have plus one and minus one, we don't need to mess with the ratio. We just need a one-to-one -one ratio. So we have NaI. You guys can also write Na1I1, but nobody does that. Okay, aluminum sulfate. Aluminum is a metal, and sulfate, that kind of sounds like it might be polyatomic ion-ish, and it is. So aluminum likes to do plus three. You guys will find that on the chart right here. Likes to do plus three. And sulfate likes to do minus two, and we'll find that on the polyatomic ion sheet right here. SO4 minus two. So we have AL, and that's a plus three, and we have SO4, and that's a minus two. Now remember with our, our ionic compounds, we need to have a net neutral charge. So how do we get plus three and minus two to come to a net neutral charge? Well, you have to find the lowest common multiple and we're gonna figure that we need to go to six. So we need to do plus six and minus six. Or we can just do the little switcheroo thing here and say that we need three sulfates and we need two aluminums, and that would give us Al2, and we need three SO4s, and SO4 is a polyatomic ion, and whenever we have more than one polyatomic ion, we need to put it in parentheses to say we have three of these packages. We have three SO4s. You don't wanna write it as S3, O12 because that's not the same thing. Also remember when you're writing formulas like sodium iodide or aluminum sulfate, the charges do not appear. Okay, phosphorus pentabromide. Ah, oh, the penta is telling us right there how many bromides we have. Yay! So that means we've got a covalent compound here because phosphorus and bromine are both nonmetals, and we can see that Greek prefix there. So we've got PBr5 because penta means five. And for phosphorus, we don't have a Greek prefix before it, so that means it's mono, which means you've got one phosphorus. Okay, magnesium nitride. Magnesium is Mg, and what on earth is nitride? Well, first let's deal with magnesium, which is a metal, so we probably have an ionic compound here. And we look at the table right here and we find that magnesium does plus two. All right, so going back to our slide, We'll say, all right, magnesiums like to do plus two. And then we say, what on earth is nitride? So we go back to our polyatomic ion page and we go, huh, there's a nitrite and a nitrate, but I don't see any nitride. And I know that I cannot change the ending on my polyatomic ions, so it must be something different. And it is. What it is, is it's the monatomic ion version of the element nitrogen. So nitrogen changes its name to nitride when it's an ion. So back to our slide. What we have is a monatomic anion, remember anion is a negative ion, and we're wondering, well, what is the negative charge on that? And if we use our handy dandy little chart here, you guys can see that when nitrogen turns to nitride, you have a charge of minus three. 
So again, we have a two and three situation. So we need to go to plus six and minus six. So how many magnesiums would we need if each of them is a plus two in order to make plus six? You'd need three of them, that's right. And if you take this right here and put it down there, again, without the charge, you'd see it would be Mg3. And how many nitrides with a charge of minus three would you need to have a total of minus six? Two, that's right. And you take the two and you can put it down there if you just want a really easy way to do it. Now, the algebraic way that we can think about this is I've got three magnesiums and they both have, they all have a plus two charge. And I'm gonna add that up to, add that up with the charges on the two nitrides, which are both minus three. And this makes a positive six and I'm adding that to this right here, which makes a negative six. And that is a total charge of zero. And a neutral compound is a happy compound. Okay, so we are at the end of this lecture. Yay! And next time we'll talk about naming acids and we'll talk about molecular structures. So stay healthy and bye for now.